firstly, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk to everybody here today. Um, just while we're sorting that out. So, how many people know what Rocket Lab does? Anybody? A few? Okay. So, basically, um, we're a company that builds rockets, unsurprisingly enough. Um, but more, I guess, more focused, we're an ideas house and we back it with um, in-house capability, credibility and partnerships. So, one of the things about doing this sort of business in New Zealand is that there is nobody else. So, there is no Boeing, there is no Northrop Grumman, there's no APK down the road to get you to build a rocket nozzle, to get you to do some avionics, to get you to do anything. And trying to buy that stuff into the, in from the United States into New Zealand is, is impossible because of the international trades and arms restriction ITAR. So um, basically we're forced to be a complete one-stop shop. So we do absolutely everything um, from electronics, avionics, through to launch vehicles, through to propulsion systems, through to launching. Um, you know, you name it, you name it, we do it. So that gives us a, a really interesting uh, niche um, really within the industry because in the United States, if you're a rocket company, you specialise in propulsion or you specialise in flight dynamics or you specialise in rocket novels and then there's more specialist fields even in that. So it's really rare to have um, all of those things under one roof and that, that gives us you know, quite, a, quite a lot of competitive advantages. Um, so we, we work with a number of companies and organisations um, within the United States. We're basically 100% export company. We don't really do much in New Zealand. Um, who knows what DARPA, the organisation DARPA? Excellent. That's great. Must be engineers. So for you who don't know who DARPA is, um, they uh, were basically formed when the, uh, the Russians put Sputnik into space and they're tasked by, directly by Congress in the United States to make sure the United States never lags behind in any technology field ever again. So that's their job. Um, you may be aware of some of their work, um, the internet, uh, GPS. So they, they only fund game-changing technologies. If you go to DARPA and say, I've got a widget which gives you a 2% improvement, they'll tell you to go away. If you go to DARPA and you say, I've got this concept, I have no idea whether it works, but if it works, it's a game changer, they're, they're interested. So they're basically our biggest customer. But is it perfectly good technology with no experience? Well, that's primarily their, their focus, yeah. So they're, they're, they're tasked by Congress to keep the United States at the head of technology, head of so the race. Sorry? So it's not about okay and perfectly one direction? Yeah. yeah. Anybody, go for gold. <laughs> Um, you might be familiar with that organisation, so we, we work with those guys. Um, ORS, Operation Responsive Space. So these guys, once again, tasked directly by Congress to get stuff into orbit cheap. That's their job. Um, and uh, so we, we work with those guys as well. So our core business, if you break down what we actually do, is um, we do propulsion, a lot of propulsion. Um, engineering, modelling, all the things you need to be able to go and do propulsion and launch vehicles. Uh, electronic systems, so avionics, um, guidance control, that sort of stuff, which ultimately results in us being able to produce space and defence products. Um, we're a company of firsts, we've done some stuff. Um, yeah, so we've done some stuff. <laughs> um, We've got three current programs running within the company at the moment. Um, VLN, which is a new propulsion system, uh, stands for viscous liquid monopropellant. And then there's Instant Eyes, which is a, which is a rapid deployed, hand launched um, UAV system. So basically, you hold onto a tube which has got a rocket in it, and you launch it, and uh, it's a UAV system. We can talk about more of that uh, in more detail later. And then um, there's our orbital program, because um, we're going orbital. So what, what is an entrepreneur and what's needed? Well, personally, I don't class myself as an entrepreneur. I think people who call themselves entrepreneurs actually aren't. Um, I'm just trying to get a job done and uh, it just happens to be a bit of fun along the way. But I guess what, what is needed, um, you need some ideas. You can't be risk adverse, that's for sure, um, which sort of leads on to the next one, which is a little bit politically incorrect, but you definitely need 
big balls, and the bigger the idea, the bigger balls you need. You need to be, have to be absolutely and completely passionate and motivated. You've got to be ready for some hard work, and um, you've got to, you've got to, you know, create your credibility. And then, most importantly, you've got to deliver because, you know, if you don't deliver, then you're out of business. So this, this sort of, th these are my opinions. So. Um, they could be right, they could be wrong, you choose. But um, I'll give you my opinions anyway. And I'll give them to you with respect to Rocket Lab. So, first thing you need is an idea. And um, my idea was building rockets and going to space. And in New Zealand, that's, yeah, I hear some giggles in the room, that's usually typical. Um, in New Zealand, that is considered nutty, absolutely nutty. If you're in the United States, it's not nutty, it's just part of commerce. You just go to space, it's just a business. Um, and that's part of the challenge that, you know, that Rocket Lab's always faced is, I remember when we had our, our, big, our big, you know, official company opening, um, we, we uh, contacted the central government to let them know that somebody in New Zealand was going to send some stuff to space and um, they ought to know about it. And uh, they thought it was a great joke and ended up getting invited to one of the minister, minister's office to, um, to have a talk to me. And it uh, turns out he told me later that he just thought this was a great joke and he wanted to see what nutty person was actually going to do this. But once we, um, once we you know, explained exactly what we were doing and how we are doing and, and the opportunities, he, he became a very strong supporter. So first thing you need is a good idea and a really bloody good one because if it's, um, if it's not, then you know, you're not going to go anywhere. But the trick is that every, a lot of people will tell you that your idea is crap. I mean, my case, case in point, um, just about everybody that you could talk to said, well, that's, how, that's a stupid idea. How can New Zealand compete with the United States? How can a little company on the other side of the world compete with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and all those sorts of things? So a lot of people will tell you that your idea is, is crap, but, I mean, you know, you've got to have a bit of belief in yourself along the way. But presumably, as, as time goes by, the technology gets more refined and hence easier to do. Well, absolutely. It goes with, that goes with, with any technology. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to, to launch a rocket into space 20 years ago is a lot more difficult than it is now. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Absolutely. Um, risk. So, um, got to be prepared to take risk. And that, that risk can mean a lot of things. It can mean engineering risk, it can mean credibility risk, it can mean financial risk. Usually it means all of those things. Um, so the risk for Rocket Lab is when we started, if we went over the United States and said we're a rocket company, we're going to be a rocket company, we're going to build rockets, we're going to launch stuff into space, and essentially be a PowerPoint company like a lot of other companies, especially in the United States, get absolutely nowhere, throw into the mix that we're a small you know, island nation in the middle of nowhere, we're not United States, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have got, if we, for example, we rocked on up to DARPA and said, look, we've got these ideas, with having no credibility done nothing, there's absolutely no way that they would have talked to us. So we made the, the internal strategy for us was we're going to build a launch vehicle and we're going to go to space. And we're going to prove that we can actually do what we you know, say we're going to do rather than you try and turn up with a PowerPoint. And not only are we going to do that, we're going to do it in, <coughs> in a way that is, is really industry contra controversial. So we could have built a launch vehicle, the rt one we could have built it a poggy old solid, real traditional technology, um, done nothing special at all and just gone to space. And, you know, that's, that's a good achievement. But um, what we, we needed to do was, was really stamp our mark. So, you know, we built an all-hybrid vehicle. Um, we did things that are talked about in the industry like wireless safe arm and fire devices that nobody's ever, you know, really does because it's, it's all unproven technology. And a whole lot of stuff that, that um, within the industry is, you know, is you just don't do that. But it'd be nice to do it. So, um, so the launch vehicle itself was um, really quite special, and, and we got a lot of well, not a lot. We got a bit of flack in the media about how small our rocket was, and um, you know, there's there's it, 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 there's an indication of, of how people don't understand. So, our rocket on the pad weighed 65 kilograms, which is absolutely nothing, and it launched two kilograms to about 120 kilometres altitude, and. Now, you might think, well, that's not a very spectacular rocket. It's only 65 kilograms. You know, you're used to these giant behemoths. Now, our competition using the same propulsion technology was 
620 kilograms in mass to do the same job. So when we launched AS, everybody said in New Zealand, man, that's a s small rocket, stink. Everyone in the United States said, how the hell did you make that thing so small? So it's just that, the, 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 you know, the, the, the difference in, in knowledge bases. But I mean, cutting to the chase, we took a huge risk with that rocket on the launch pad. That rocket had a safety factor of 1.1 to 1.2 on just about every component. So that means that the pressure vessel held 1,000 psi. At 1,100 psi, it was shrapnel. Um, so every little piece on that vehicle had a safety factor of ridiculously small, and we pushed the limits to the, you know, to as, as far as you, you possibly could. And we did that because we wanted to build a vehicle that weighed 65 kilograms, not 620 odd kilograms. So, and as a result, um, you know, I'm, I'm diverging a bit, but the point is that if that rocket blew up on the pad, we wouldn't have been in business. That would have been the end of Rocket Lab, right there and then. So. We took a huge risk, both technically, financially, um, but we knew that if we could pull it off, we would get to talk to people like DARPA, we would get to, talk, get to work with people like NASA, because all of a sudden, you know, it's people have, how did you do that? So, second thing you need is, is, is courage, we'll say. <laughs> so, like I was saying before, is, is a lot of people will tell you that your idea is, is really crap. And the, like I was saying, the bigger the idea, the more people will tell you it's crap. But um, you've just got to push through it. And I mean, chances are your idea probably is crap and it probably will fail. But you know, if you don't push through it, then you could miss out on something quite spectacular. So I guess don't be afraid to just put your balls on the line. Passion and motivation. You need to be absolutely passionate about your idea, about your business, and you need to be highly, highly motivated. If you're, um, if it's just sort of a fun thing that you'd like to try, don't even bother, don't waste your time. If, if you're not an extremely motivated person by nature, like you're a person who comes home, sits on the couch, watches a bit of telly, goes to bed, don't bother. You've got to be absolutely motivated in whatever you do. If you're the kind of guy who comes home, sit down, watch television for five minutes, bored as hell with it, goes and do, do your sport or whatever there you do in your spare time, then you know it's for you. But if you're, if you're not motivated, just don't, don't even waste your time. Hard work. You've got to be prepared for massive amounts of hard work. It looks, you, you sort of think, oh yeah, this looks a bit easy, looks, it doesn't look too bad. But the reality is, um, it's just enormously hard work. I mean, and you sort of, you, you get out what you put in as well. Not all the time, sometimes you'll put in heaps and fail miserably, but that's, that's just th the way it is. Be prepared to lose all your sleep, that's for sure. So the other thing is, is credibility, getting into business. So with Rocket Lab, as you know, we you know, we, we took a huge risk and, and built that rocket and, and away we went. Now, you can apply that theory to whatever product you've got. Or, I, don't, I don't know, you know, this cup, for example. Um, you know, you can make a PowerPoint to that cup. You can, you, can, you know, you talk about it. But if you actually go out there and make it, prove that it works, and, and gain some credibility with it, then, then you're in a much, you're much, um, you know, forward position. I guess you'll see a recurring theme here is, is a lot of people talk about doing it. Like most people talk about doing it, but actually just going out there and physically creating something is, you know, for me is, is, is the key. And then finally, once you've done a bit, you've done what, whatever you're going to do, you, you, you know, you've created your cup, oh good I've created a cup, then you've got to deliver. So. It's, it's all very good and well to raise some capital, go out there, make your product. But the, actually the hard work is after you've done all that. If you think, you know, for, for Rocket Lab, launching that rocket was the hardest thing, absolutely not at all. The hardest thing is after that, is, is growing the company, staying in business and, and, and moving forward. That's, that's my opinion anyway. So I kept it short because I thought there'd be some questions, um, so please. Open the floor. What do you mean by uh, lose? I mean, 
who was going to drop into that apart from you? Your current PR team. Um, well, there's ten of us there and a couple of PhDs. Um, in the beginning, there was there was just two of us, um, but yeah. And well, that's that's who's employed at Rocket Lab. I mean, in the in the wider team, you know, we've got relation we have relationships with lots of different organisations and universities. And if you want to count them as part of the team, then you can do that as well. Yeah. Yep, that's a great question. Well, I'm I'm putting something in orbit, so that's that's what I'm doing. Whether I that that's my I've got to achieve that before I die, and it just so happens that there's a really really good commercial model there to do that. If you look at what's happening within our industry at the moment, space shuttles out, government funded programs old hat. It's all about commercial space now. You look at SpaceX and the Falcon 9. I mean, I'm probably not space geeks, but I mean there's. It's all going commercial, and mm -hmm. in New Zealand, and uh, Rocket Lab in particular, is is really nicely poised to capture a particular niche market of s very small satellites for a, for a number of reasons. But yep, so we want to be launching something to orbit every month. Is our goal? Is there anything available in New Zealand that makes a particular Yes, there is. There's lots, and I'll, I'll explain some of the good things and some of the bad things. The great thing is that it's never been done before in New Zealand. So that, that covers um, both thinking from an engineering perspective, business, regulatory environment, all of that sort of stuff. It's never been done before. One of the reasons um, that some of the organisations like working with us, if they've got a problem, they'll give a problem to half a dozen United States universities to solve. And they'll all go back to their textbooks, to back to their lecturers, back to their Lockheed Martins and their Boeings and they'll all come back with the same piece of 50 year old heritage hardware, the way it's taught, this is how you do it, and there it is. They come to Rocket Lab, we don't have any of that. We don't know what can't be done. And you know, we'll look at the problem and go, well, we'll just do it this way. And the, the solution is just orders of magnitude different to what the traditional industry. So that's a great thing about being in New Zealand is, is the regulatory environment, you know, the, the, the lack of knowledge, and the lack of constraints. But the bad thing is the converse, because um, we learn hard lessons too because we don't have that experience and you know I think probably our motor explosion rate is higher than some of the others in the industry for sure but we also don't know what boundaries exist so we tend to push them where other people say well you don't do that because it didn't work 50 years ago but you know give it a go now so, so yeah, there's plus and minuses. We, so that's another thing about our propulsion. So, okay, in the industry it's polarised. There's liquids or solids. There's only two, and when I say like, yeah, it's probably better. So liquid fuels, where liquid fuel rocket motor is where you've got two liquids, a liquid oxidiser and a liquid fuel. And you, you know, inject them with turbo pumps into the combustion chamber and away you go. A solid fuel rocket is all solid and it's like a firecracker, so like a skyrocket. So you light it and it burns and it doesn't stop burning until it's depleted its propellant. So, in the United States, especially, there's two industries. Now, if you're a liquids guy, you go solids, yucky old solids, toxic, horrible solids. If you're a solids guy, you go liquids are for drinking. Who would do that? So it's really, really polarised in the United States. We, we do liquids, solids, hybrids, and our VLM, which is some, some, something in between, and seamlessly cross over all of those disciplines. And that's sort of what makes us a little bit special in the propulsion side of things as well, is we don't necessarily have a preference for solids or have a preference, preference for liquids or anything like that. So to answer your questions, we do liquids, we do hybrids, so you know the propellants for liquids, I mean huge list, but typically liquid oxygen and kerosene. Um, hybrids, nitrous oxide and HTPBs, solids, HTPB, AP, ALs, and then viscous liquid monopropellants, um, can't tell you. So. No, I've heard that there is something called unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Oh, you don't want to go near that stuff. Major environmental problems in the old Soviet Union. It still does. It, the, trouble, the trouble with hydrazine is it is a really good fuel. It's just toxic as hell, like part per million and you're dead. But that's, that's why I've heard that the rapid space program liked it because it was the first fuel 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep, it killed a lot of people. But that dye, methyl hydrazine's uh, not hydrogen itself, right? It's a compound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Modified form of hydrogen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're trying to avoid some of the... Oh, I would never, we never that. touch hydrazine, no. No way. It's, it's always the way, though. Anything that's really, really good is really, really dangerous and really bad. It's just the way it is. Well, it's like the other and the other Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just like when you start off with that, do you have the intention of going to merge still with your spec or do you just want to send something out to the spec, then research the camera and then merge it? No. I mean, uh, absolutely commercial from day one. I mean, uh, in the very early days, um, we secured some, some uh, venture capital, some angel investment, and um, you know, you don't do that with a dream. It's, it's got to be commercial. No, we're still pretty much the only company in the Southern Hemisphere doing this stuff. Yeah. But if you have a good outline of um, some of your products and, and um, technologies and all the Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, so going back to the three programs, um, VLM, viscous liquid monopropellant, it's, it's not a solid, it's not a liquid, it's sort of a funky fluid solid in between those, um, and uh, that's funded by <coughs> directed by DARPA, um, and uh, that's all I can say about that. Now, um, the other product is Instant Eyes, um, which is, uh, well, that's that product there. So basically, um, cut a long story short, I was watching Discovery Channel one night, and they were um, one of those future weapons, it was, where they, where they were showcasing this new, new UAV system, and there was, a there was a soldier who was hunted behind a wall getting shot at, and they were saying, this is great, he's pulling out this UAV out of his backpack, he's assembling this UAV, and then he's flying it, getting intelligence to find out who's shooting at him. And they are saying, isn't this great? And not only do you have to assemble this thing, and you've got to become a pilot, it takes five minutes. And I thought, that is just crap. There's got to be a better way of getting intelligence for that. So, um, I'm a great favourite for rockets, as you saw. Um, so basically what the concept was is it's packaged in a tube about that high, 50, mil 50 millimetres round, weighs, um, weighs 500 grams. And this tube just sits in a soldier's backpack. And when he's hunkered down and someone's shooting at him, he pulls out this tube, pushes the button, pop, and this thing within 13 seconds is at 2,500 feet, relaying ultra high definition um, video with GPS referenced and uh, compass referenced data to his mobile device, whether it be a military rover or an iPhone or an iPad, and he can decide within between 15 and 20 seconds if he's going to run or hide, or is there a tank there? Yes, I'm out of here. Is there somebody there? And yeah, so that, that's basically that. And we took the concept to a, a US company and um, formed a joint venture called Instant Eyes Corporation, funny enough. And um, so that's the product. We just finished it a few months ago, and it's currently at, um, at some uh, defence organisations being tested. Um. Where's the camera on it, and how does it actually take? Um, does, it, does it wait until it gets to the top of its trajectory? Yep, it senses apogee, and the camera's right at the nose. So it's a funky little vehicle. It pulls 30 Gs out of the launch tube, spins up from zero to 6,000 RPM in 0.8 of a second. And uh, then reaches apogee, as I say, sort of around about 13 seconds, and then deploys its parachute and uh, stabilizes itself, and then takes these images and georeferences and, and all that sort of stuff. Now that entire project, from concept to testing, was about 10 months. So, um, so that's 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 that product. And then um, our other major program is our orbital program. So we've we've got a team working on that. With the ultimate goal is to descend around about between 25 and 50 kilograms into LEO, which is sort of a sweet spot for small satellites. But then it's not geostate. No, not geostate, no. Thanks no. for your thoughts, Peter. Um, forgive me for asking an amateur question, but compared to, say, the RC-01, mm -hmm. what sort of scale of rockets required to send a small payload into orbit? <laughs> So RT-1165, we're sitting at around about five tons for that vehicle. Yep. 
thought. What's the most deca- in terms of <coughs> class per kilogram of payload? What's the most economical size of rockets to use? Well, it's a tricky one. G- generally, the bigger the better. Oh, okay. Yeah, the bigger the better. However, um, that's not always the case. And the thing is, with satellites in, in the satellite industry at the moment, is it's all going small. Electronics have mini- miniaturised, propulsion systems are miniaturised, everything's miniaturised. So the need for these five ton behemoths on orbit, costing a billion dollars in 10 years to put up there, is fast decreasing. What everybody wants is a real cheap satellite, a real cheap launch, put it onto orbit. If your orbit decays fast and you only get it two years out of it, it's so cheap, and you cut chances are you want to retask the satellite anyway, just send up another one. So that's, that's the way the, the, the industry's moving. So in terms of energy efficiency, the big, big rockets are better, but in terms of the time it takes to design them, the small rockets are better. Yeah, and the thing is if a big rocket goes up, like if, if the big rocket has a failure, I should say, yeah, like you've lost a billion dollars or more in 10 years. If a little rocket has a failure, Next week, you put another one up. Why 10 years? Well, typically, that's how long it takes to go from concept conception through the funding cycle oh, through so to all the development. Fa- if it fails, it means there's something wrong with the design. Well, no, rockets fail all the time. I mean, rockets with 30, 40 year heritages fail because it's just the nature of the business. I mean, stuff goes wrong. It only takes one tiny little thing to not work 100%, and that's it. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean, the this, this space tourism and all that sort of stuff, at the end of the day, the space industry is driven by two things, defence and commercial industry, such as comms, satellites, and all that sort of stuff, yeah. There is no recycling or uh, any resource gathering in space for, for the moon industry right now. Oh, there's talks about it. I mean, DARPA have got a program where they're reserve, trying to resurface satellites to send up another satellite to that's you know out of life and fill up its propellant tanks and get it, give it another 10, 15 years. So there's, there's stuff like that going on. Um, but as far as you know, mineral extraction and stuff like that, it still doesn't make commercial sense. No. Yeah. Just moving on from that, uh, you know, how New Zealand seems to be in the Um, not really. I mean, at the end of the day, wh- what is efficiency? I mean, you can build a ginormous rocket that carries, like I say, you know, five ton payload um, that might stay up there for, for five or ten years or five years. You know, if you look at the resources required from, you know, the entire holistic picture of the resources required to put that one satellite up, is that a better use of the Earth's resources than five or ten little satellites on little rockets that do the same job? And the answer is yes, it is. And that's why the industry is, it costs less too, so that's why the industry is gravitating towards that way. I've got no desire to build these big rockets. Some people, big is better and all that. I mean, there's a, the little stuff is, is you know, it is efficient, so. Yep, so initially um, it was through an angel investor and then um, basically we're funded through the programs that, um, that we, we do for our customers. It's, it's a lovely, lovely business model because they fund us and we own the intellectual property at the end of it. So it doesn't get much better than that. Whereas if you're going out to the venture capital market, then you all of a sudden you start diluting equity. That's me in two, gee, when was that? 2001? Always like rockets. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, like every teenager, I started off doing, you know, mucking around with cars and, and I built up a Mini and then I turbocharged it and 
and it just seems such a pathetic way of making power, you know, the internal combustion engine. So then I started to muck around with stuff that had a bit more energy density. And <laughs> so yeah, it was right from right from day one. I, I was so I was so going to be interested in some of my own reasons. I thought rockets were only energy efficient when they approached the speed of sound. Is that right? Uh, no, that's when they're least efficient. That's a transonic reason. That's the most least efficient. So can you have a rocket? Why can't you have an aeroplane propelled by a rocket to make a jet? Well, you you can, but I mean. With a rocket, you're carrying your oxidizer. A gas turbine, the oxidizer is there for free in the atmosphere. So, you can, can you have like a rocket that's efficient at, say, car driving speed, 100 kilometres an hour? Uh, you could, but where rockets really excel is packing a whole lot of energy into a really small space and releasing it really fast. That's, that's weird. But, I mean, could you get reasonable efficiency, say, at only 100 kilometres? Um, no. No, so really there, that's, I, I don't know. I put, it, put it this way, put it this way. In this bottle of wine, yeah. I could probably fit around about a thousand horsepower in this bottle of wine. So a uh, one metre watt, a rocket. Yep. That can produce a metre watt of yep. mechanical power. Yep. Might only be for half a second, but... Yeah. I'll fit a thousand horsepower in there. But what sort of, yeah. But if it only gets efficient, <coughs> but I right think the only sort of rocket only becomes efficient when it reaches like the vehicle's propelling reaches high speed. Well, you're talking about two different things here. One's propulsion and one's vehicle dynamics. Oh, no. Yeah. I think we're um, running out of time. So cool. we've got one more question, if we, if we don't mind. Yep. No, we, yep, we're still, we're still, we're kind of like a consultancy business, if you want to look at that, yeah. that sort of model. So, you know, we require projects to, you know, to sustain ourselves. I mean, we have products, as you know, with the instant eyes, and that's, you know, that's transitioning in to become our bread and butter, if you would. But, um, but there is, a, well, most US companies are funded through that way, aerospace companies. If you look at the amount of investment that the big, you know, the giants make in R and D, it's like one percent. Even though they've got a ten percent R and D budget, nine percent is that is of that is funded by their governments.